Amen. How many people know that we are a blessed congregation? We thank God for Pastor Al, Miss Tava, Pastor Cam, and Pastor Michaela. Can we just give a glad hand clap for them? Amen. We are a blessed people. Hallelujah. This morning, I want to take my time. Now, there's been a nasty rumor out there that I'm a long-winded preacher. <laughs> but trust me, I'm going somewhere. You see, when you go around a circle for a year, constantly, God gives you some things to say. Amen. But one thing that we want to make sure is that we have the presence of God in this place. Now, we said that we love the Lord, that when we worship the Lord, we aren't just worshiping and just blessing Him from our lips, but our hearts get into it. So we never want to go anywhere without His presence because we understand that in His presence, there is fullness of joy, that there is strength, that there is healing, that there are people in this place right now that need to get into the presence of God and get whatever those things broken off of them so that their hearts are going to be open and ready to receive. And so there is a little song that I, that I want to sing because we want the presence of God in here. And it's like, Holy Spirit, fill this place. Fill this room. Shekinah glory, sweet perfume. We need your presence. We need you. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Now, if you're hungry for God, it's the hunger that attracts the presence of God. Just go ahead and stand to your feet. And we're going to sing this song. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Shekinah glory, sweet perfume. We need your presence. We need you. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Shekinah glory, sweet perfume. We need your presence. We need you. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Now sing it like you mean it. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Chicana glory, sweet perfume. We need your presence. We We welcome in your presence. We thank you for your presence here in this auditorium. We thank you for your presence where your people are gathering live stream. Every place where your people are hungry. Father, we gather to have an encounter with you. Father, we don't need information, but we need an encounter. For it's in your presence is strongholds broken down. It's in your presence that we're able to see clearly. It's in your presence we receive healing and restoration and refreshing. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask you would move through every heart, that you would illuminate our understanding. We pray for your presence to fall in this place. Touch every heart. I thank you, Lord God, that you are speaking to each and every person under the sound of my voice. I thank you for the fruit that will be produced today. I thank you for the fruit that will be produced in the replays. And we just pray, Lord, that you just invade this place. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Praise God. Amen. Can you uh, just remain standing for just a moment? I didn't say sit down. Red light, green light. No. <laughs> There's two scriptures that I want us to really focus on this morning. The first one is Matthew 6 and 33 and 34. And the second one is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Now see, this is not going to be a message. This isn't just going to be a message of information, but I just pray that it would be a message of application. I pray that it would not be a message of condemnation, but I believe that God has something to say to encourage people to become the best people that He created for them to be which means that we are going to be pressing through seasons. When I was here the first time, we talked about the seasons that we go through in life, that we understand that we go through good seasons and we go through challenging seasons. But all things are working together for good. That's right. That God is sculpting and changing us, that He is molding and making us into the people that He wants us to be. And if you don't hear anything else today, that if you apply these two scriptures, that at the end of the year, when you look back, you're going to see that you are farther along than you could ever be. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and read the first one. Matthew 6 and 33 and 34. And this comes from the Passion Translation. Let's read it together. So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from Him. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on Him to guide you and He will lead you in every decision that you make. Become intimate with Him in whatever you do and He will lead you wherever you go. Amen. Hallelujah. You can take your seats. You know, a lot of time in this culture, when we think of an abundant life, we think of people that have a lot of money. We think that if we are living our best life, then we are athletically fit, that we have a six-pack, amen? We think that we have the best and the finest things. But my Bible tells me what would it gain a person if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. And so we understand that this world is diametrically opposed to what God would have us to be and what he would have us to do. A lot of times when we look at that first scripture that seek ye first the kingdom of God, what happens a lot of times we live in an Amazon culture, don't we? <laughs> we seek everything else and then we seek God. Or we go through this life and the only time that we seek God is if something happens. We know how that is. That when something happens, oh God, where are you in all this? When we understand the nature of who God is, we understand those two scriptures that everything starts and begins and ends in Him. And as we put God first, then He will take care of everything else. That we don't have to worry about anything. Now the first time I was here back in November, I kind of shared that I said, um, this was one of the scriptures that we were talking about. And we said that the body of Christ uh, has left their first love for the most part. That the only time that we think about God in large part is on Sunday morning or if it's something political or whatever. And what God is saying that it's not just about when you seek Him for salvation, but when you seek Him, you seek Him in everything. You want to seek Him for your finances. You want to seek Him for your marriage. You want to seek Him for your children. 
All those things that when we put God first, we have the right order. And so what's happening is the body of Christ that we don't have the right order all the time. When we talk about an abundant life, we're talking about a life that's full and overflowing. It's a life that makes a difference. Does anybody want to make a difference in here? It's the kind of life when you're not there that people are going to see that there is a vacuum. The Bible says apart from God and without Him, you'll never be able to become the person that God created you to be. A lot of times we have in our own mind and in our own heart with the best version of what we should look like. But that's not necessarily God's version. It's not necessarily that. And so when we talk about the version that God has for us, we have to look to the blueprint. And if we leave God out of the process, then we might be something that we might feel good about, but you'll find that there's still something missing, that there's still some dry places in your life. It's only when you're in the center of God's will and in His timing, it's only then are you going to feel, this is right. This is where I need to be. Anybody want to be in the center of God's will? Amen. Amen. And so... A few years ago, when I was still in the Air Force, I got asked to do a prayer breakfast. And so they asked me if I could speak. And I spoke about the gospel. It was the prayer breakfast. It was the area and the venue to be able to talk about Jesus. And I said, well, the Air Force core values integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all you do. But I had to change it up a little bit. I put Jesus first. Because if you don't have Jesus, you're not going to have integrity. You're not going to have uh, service before self, and you're not going to have excellence in all you do. Now, the wing commander and all the different people that were there, the important muckety-mucks and all that, they loved it. And it's almost like they never heard the gospel before. And they said, Sergeant Adderley, can you please address the base at commander's call? I said, sir, I will address the basic commander's call, but I cannot leave Jesus out. I can't just tell you about the core values without Jesus. You leave the most important thing out. And sometimes the church leaves the most important thing out. Now, you might be very faithful that there are people that are doing the right thing, but you can't leave the main ingredient out. For instance, when we have our morning devotionals at some time, we might go and we might read and we might pray and we might um, worship, but if God's not in it, you left the most important thing out. And I believe, especially as we go into this political year, we can't leave the most important thing out. We have to understand that God is a vital necessity. It's not about our feelings and everything else because we understand that feelings change. We understand that we, do, we can't anchor ourselves in our feelings. But we understand that God is our anchor. People try to grow on their own. And we've heard it for the last few weeks of growth and expansion. Now, I'm not talking about my growth and expansion from the last 15 years. I'm talking about growth and expansion. No. <laughs> I was very good at growth and expansion before. Too many people try to grow on their own apart from God. See, it's not about what we think, what others say about us or our culture. And I really love what Pastor Al, Ms. Tava, Pastor Cam, Pastor Michaela, and others have shared over the past few weeks regarding activating our faith and being responsible for our own personal growth and expansion. You have to understand anything that's going to cost you something, it's going to be a sacrifice. You aren't going to be able to grow and expand just by osmosis. You aren't going to be able to lay on your Bible and that information is going to be transferred into your spirit or into your head. It's going to take you something. See, our goal isn't just to make it to heaven and be a group of nice people. 
God wants all of us to grow individually and corporately. We would look really strange you being 30 years old and wearing a diaper, right? Anything that's alive is going to grow and expand. And in my first message, I said what happened is I got comfortable. There are some times that we can get comfortable and complacent, and that is the enemy to growth and expansion. Anything that's alive is going to grow. If your relationship with God is alive, we need to move when he moves. When he stops, we need to stop. There's going to be things that take place in our life, things that are going to challenge us, but we need to move with him. And we need to be able to hear his voice. And we have to take responsibility where it starts in me. Now, I said this is a message that I believe is going to challenge the body of Christ. One of the things that I always looked at, I used to run away from my personality that God gave me, but I've learned to embrace it now. I remember that I always ask myself, why do I feel the way that I do? Why do I say some of the things that I say? Why do people approach me or they look at me a certain way? And I used to run away from it. In other words, part of my personality is I'm an introvert. And I'll tell you more about that. But there were certain things, even at nine years old, that I knew in my spirit intrinsically that God wanted me to help people. This was part of the DNA. This was part of who I was. In high school, after we had our uh, what do you call it? The, the end of year awards. I got the best buns award. <laughs> but after that, I got most willing to help a friend. Vicki never wanted me to tell anybody about that. <laughs> See, when we look at the scriptures, Matthew 6 and 33 and 34 and Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, they serve as blueprints for Christians to live a successful life and for us to grow and expand as we choose to align our hearts with God. It's a choice that we make. That we can be mediocre, we can operate in our own giftings and talent, or we can align our hearts with God and become the people that God wants us to be and to do the things that he created us to do. See, all God is looking for, he is not asking you to do the heavy lifting, all he's asking for is for you to add your yes to what he puts in your heart. Whatever it is. You know, so often we try to figure out the different circumstances and everything, and God just said, step out. Just do it. And I believe that there's people in this place today. 21 years ago, when I was ordained in August 1st of 2004, that Pastor Randy, who is with me, he's now up in heaven, that pastor said, after hands were laid on, he said, go ahead and address the congregation. Okay. <laughs> and what I said was that there is people that are in this congregation, many of whom have been in ministry, and I believe that there are many that feel used, cast out, that there would be a time to where they need to get refreshed, where God is able to work in their lives. And I said that I want to get as many people as possible back into ministry, back into serving, back into the place that God would have them at the right time. I have no idea why I said that. That was 21 years ago in August. And a lot of the people that I work with now in the ministries, a lot of times we look, they look at me and they call me Pastor Pushy. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. God is looking for our yes. And I love what it says in that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord completely. And do not rely on your own opinions. If we trust in God, we have to trust Him in the good times or the bad times. We have to trust Him when we don't know what to do. It's because of that relationship that we can trust Him. See, religion doesn't do that. Religion just says, do it. 
But when you have a relationship with someone and you press into the presence, it's where God is able to break through. It's because you can trust that person and you can rely on him. And I love in verse 6 where it says, become intimate with him. And we have to understand, as you become intimate with God, it's a process. It's a process over time. It's not always easy. It's not always convenient. Your flesh is not going to want to always do that. But when you make up in your mind that you want to get close to God, he's waiting with open arms. It's not just an occasional thing, but it becomes our lifestyle. See, it's not just enough to hear and receive what God's telling us. We need to have boldness and faith to step out and to do it. You can have all the information in the world. God can give you all the guidance that you need. But if you never follow that guidance, if you never step out because either we're in the way or we have a fear, you're never going to be able to get to where God wants you to be. We need to be like the children of Israel when the cloud moved during the day. It was a pillar of cloud. At night, it was a pillar of fire. When the cloud moved, the people moved. When the cloud stood still, the people stood still. And so I ask God, it's like, why do I think the way that I do? And one of my sisters sent me the Myers-Briggs personality um, test. I happen to be an INFJ. An INFJ. Now, out of all the people walking around on earth, we are the rarest people out there. We are one to three percent, and to be an INFJ male, you're about half a percent. When we talk about our personality, it's the way that we deal with people, the way that we deal with situations, and the way that we see the world. It's not 100% accurate, but married people, I would want to find out what your personality type is and that of your spouse, so you will know how to deal with them and the things that can help. Now, we are Christians, amen, and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, so we can do all things. But there's always going to be a default setting that we go back to. And so as an INFJ, I'm going to say, we're weird. We're different. But it's in a good way. Pastor Sharon, Rhonda Shull, Pastor Josiah, and me all have the same personality. And I found out that Pastor Thomas and Pastor David all have that same personality which means that you have all the INFJs probably in Cumberland County right in this church. <laughs> One of the big things that motivate us is our passion is to grow and help others to grow. We are the ones that when we read a book or we get something that piques our attention, we are going to go into it and we are not going to stop until we get everything about it. Now some of the characteristics of what an INFJ. We are compassionate. We're empathetic. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. It's where you take on the emotions and the feelings of others around you, but you're able to sympathize with them. We're idealistic. We look through rose-colored glasses. We're sensitive. We're introverts, but we flow as extroverts for short periods of time. And God shows us things within people. That's where the pastor pushy comes from. That we can see through different things. Someone can say something, but then we can see through their body language and through the things that are revealed to us. We hate conflict. We love time alone. We hate criticism. We're encouragers. We're good listeners. We're always underestimated and many times rejected because people don't know how to take us. We try and help people realize their full potential. Say full potential. A lot of times we live in our heads and our imaginations. There's always something running in the background. And it takes a lot to get us mad. But we want to be like Bill Bixby. You wouldn't like us when we get mad. Because we tend to make messes. 
We've been known to be stubborn even at times. And so I want to really focus in on that last one, the stubbornness in a positive way. You see, if we find something that gets our attention, we want to know everything about it, and we aren't going to turn it loose until we research everything to be known about it. In my case, it's God. It's that's what's kept me engaged. I never knew that a year ago that my journey would have started. Since August 2023, my family and I have faced the most challenging season in all our lives. First, with my congestive heart failure that just seemed to come out of nowhere. And by the way, one of the, one of the characteristics of an INFJ is that we can care for a lot of people, but sometimes we don't take care of ourselves. In other words, I was more in the Martha to where I'm going and going and going, and I didn't spend enough time in the Mary phase to where I sat at the feet of Jesus. And so I was trying to do a whole lot of the heavy lifting, and I didn't even realize that for the longest period of time. And so one of the consequences of what was going on is that I had congestive heart failure. And for those of you that don't know, the whole testimony is back there in November, and you can, you can watch that. But basically, my heart was squeezing at 25, and it was supposed to be squeezing at 55, which means my heart could have stopped at any moment. And so it was a very difficult season. I trusted God. I believe God. I've seen that he's healed me before. I know that he could do it again, and absolutely he did. And so we talked about a season, that seasons have beginnings, they have middle, and they have endings. Seasons don't last all way. But lo and behold, at the, what I thought was the end of the first season to where God healed me, then Vicki wound up passing away. When you look at someone like Vicki, I kind of equate her to somebody like Pastor Jeff or Dana Amos, who passed away, and it's like uh, the Nestor Velasquez. That there are people that you see a lot of times, but you don't realize how special they are. You don't realize that they are heart and soul type people. That's my, that's my honey right there. That's my boo bear. <laughs> I listened to that first message and it was really ironic that four, three months later that a lot of the things where I was encouraging people to go through talking about faith and putting God first and dealing uh, in, the, in the way that he wanted me to deal and how he wanted me to be healed that I was flying. I was just feeling great and everything else. And we understand that seasons can change. If you have loved ones in your life, we need to thank them right now. We need to give them their flowers. We need to appreciate them. If you have your spouse, you need to know that you're blessed and that there is no small things that need to be left undone. I didn't have the opportunity to be able to tell Vicki everything that I wanted to tell her, but while she still had her mind intact, the last thing that I told her, that Vicki Adderley, not only do I love you, but I'm in love with you. And so from my family, Melanie, JJ, Michael, Stephen, and Nolan, Vicki has been an incredible wife, an incredible mother, an incredible grandmother. There is no one that even compares and even if I move on at some point down the road, I don't ever, I, it would be unfair to try to compare someone with her. 37 years is a long time. Now we've lost different people in our family. And the thing is, is that for my children, I know that they're going through, for my grandson that he is going through, I know that many of you in this place are still going through. And I can't speak to everyone specifically, but I can speak to how I'm feeling today. And I never knew that something could hit me so hard. This is a little bit different. For the last 10 years, I've been ministering to families. I've been helping put together funerals, homegoing services, memorial services. I've been meeting with families in the different thing. 
But I want to use a thought for this moment. I must keep moving forward. Those five words have defined my life over these last four months. I must keep moving forward. And when you have a loss of a spouse, you understand that there is a revelation that the two become one flesh. And when we came in, we were a package deal, and we've been here since 2000. And so when she went to be with the Lord, half of me went with her. And at first I said, you know what, I'm done. I did 20 years here. I need to do something else. I'm done. But God had different plans. You understand that when you trust God, that you're going to go through seasons to where you are going to have pressure. That you're going to go through some things. God never said that you aren't going to have pressures or you're not going to have challenges. The storms of life happen to everyone. But one thing I determined in my heart is that I must leave February. So many times when things happen, people get stuck in place with that trauma, with that tragedy, and that they have the inability to be able to move forward into what God has for them. And so looking at February, yes, I love my wife. I love her more today than I did then. And yes, I did appreciate her. And yes, I did take care of her. And yes, she was just amazing. And I will never forget that. I want to thank Pastor Al and everyone else, but I mean especially Pastor L, because Pastor L put everything down. My family thanks everyone for the prayers, the words of encouragement, and everything that took place. Pastor was there, he was ministering, he was encouraging, he was working behind the scenes, and I tell you, it means more to me than anything else. It means more to our family than anything else. So we understand that we have good and bad seasons, Sometimes you can have a season within a season, like what I was going through. But in whatever kind of season we find ourselves in, we must keep moving forward through that season. See, I thought the season was for me to get my healing and to get closer to God. And I did. But that wasn't God's main reason. See, God knew the real reason behind the season that started last August. And it served as preparation for things to come. If you're in a good season, you need to prepare. Amen? Three things can happen in a season. One, you can get stuck. You can continue to move forward, but you can go in a circle and not get to where you're going. God says, go this way, and you stay here. The second thing is, is that you can move forward but go backwards. That's where you disconnect from the life of God. That's where you try to figure things out on your own. The third thing is, you can move forward with God. And that's what God wants. He wants us to move forward with Him. See, God wants us to constantly move forward in His plans and His timing, and we understand that God's timing is crucial. When you move forward with God, you're never going to get stuck because He's always moving forward and going somewhere. That's an important point. That when God says to move, your flesh might not want to move, your emotions might not want to move, but you have to keep moving forward because you're going somewhere. I met a lot of families who lost loved ones and facilitated grief share classes and we lost a lot of dear CL family members. That's why I call heaven covenant love north. That they're up there right now. And I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of them. We understand that there's going to be loss at times in life. And nothing prepared me for the nightmare that we we're about to experience. And we instantly flowed into a new season. There was a time that I hit rock bottom, but God stepped in. How many people know that God will step into your situation? That's right. My daughter Melanie was talking about the kitchen was torn up because there was some water damage in the walls. And so at one point, 
My house was torn up. I had 15 holes in the wall. I had things torn out of the kitchen and everything else. I was at my lowest point. But as I was sitting there, God explained how He puts people and lives back together. It's through trust and reliance upon Him. Let's have those pictures there of what it looked like. This is what I was looking at. It was lonely. It was nasty. Things were torn out. Keep going. That's what it looked like. And God said that through it all, that He would help. He would give us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would be the one to begin to put things back together. Vicki had the vision for the kitchen. Now, I, I didn't have the expertise to do it myself, but what happens when people get into tragedies and different things, then they try to figure it out themselves apart from God. It looked bad, and sometimes it'll get nastier before it gets better. That's right. But because Vicki had the vision, I had to trust that the contractor was going to have the ability to do and to formulate what her vision was. And from that nastiness and everything else, God put it back together. All the holes were filled. Everything was painted. And everything was put back together. It's like an illustration, a plane flying in IFR weather, which means you cannot see out the window. It's just cloudy. And a lot of times, that pilot needs to know where they're going. They need to know whether they're going this way into the ground, whether they're climbing. And the clouds represent the turbulence that we go through a lot of times that we don't know where we're going. And we have to rely on our instruments and we have to understand that our instruments are the Word of God, the presence of God. Our instruments are being able to hear from the Holy Spirit so that we have the right attitude and we know exactly where we are even when everything is going on around us. For Christians in time of certainty, we need the Word of God and we need God's presence. Yes, I kept walking through this season. I walked with a purpose. While I was walking, I was not exercising. So please don't ask me, what do you do? <laughs> back, no, back in November, I lost 70 pounds. The heaviest I was was 319 pounds. But back in November... I lost 70 pounds. And since November, I've lost another 41 pounds for a total of 111 pounds. Amen. I don't want to sound religious, but I wasn't exercising. What I was doing, I was walking and spending my time with God. Now you have to understand that even though we are spiritual beings, that there are things that we have to go through. There's things that we have to settle in our mind. So I walked through that season and I kept walking with God. I was mad at God and I had questions. I love when Pastor Cam, can I be real? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I love when Pastor Cam was saying, you know, we can question God, we can ask him different things. And I'll just tell you straight up, I was mad at God and I had questions. See, I couldn't pray and had some real trust issues with God. Has that ever happened with anyone? Okay, all you religious people. Has that ever happened with anyone? <laughs> See, I didn't realize that he was talking. I wasn't happy when I thought God stopped speaking to me when we needed him the most. And I said it to a number of people. It's like, as I'm walking, when times are good, I'm hearing all these different things and and God is pouring into me, and, and I just loved it. But when the time came, I said that God isn't speaking to me. And that's something that bothered me. I didn't realize He was talking and working behind the scenes through people all the time. There was times that we were in the hospital, in the ICU, and we saw the church rise up, that they had Vicky's picture up, that they were praying. I've never seen anything like that to where the church shut down and everyone got together which means that there was a cause. And it's through the prayers, it's through the words of encouragement, it's through the food, way too much food, but I thank God for it. <laughs> and the prayers. I realized God confirmed, uh, I realized that God was working behind the scenes through people. 
And I realized that God confirmed that Vicky made a choice. Yes, there was enough prayer that went up. Yes, there was enough authority released. But we have to understand just the same as Pastor Jeff said he wanted to go be with the Lord. Vicky said that she wanted to go be with the Lord. So I had my nevertheless moment. And I'm not going to stand up here and be religious or anything else. It's just like Jesus. Like, Jesus, if we can do this any other way, let's try it. And it didn't happen that way. And so I had to respect that Vicky made a choice. Now, I knew God was always faithful, but I couldn't understand why things happened the way that they did. I know that the word is true. My faith was still intact. I knew where she was, and I know that I'll see her again. But the bottom line is, is that she isn't here with me or the family. And that is where the tension comes in. My question to you this morning is, what would you do if things didn't turn out exactly as you wanted? Is God just faithful when it turns out the way that we want? Is God unfaithful? See, everyone grieves differently, and early on I screamed, I yelled to the point that I started getting a form of broken heart syndrome. And this works directly against everything that God healed me from. To the point I went to the emergency room, and they wanted to keep me overnight. In the hospital, I refused. Did I say I was stubborn? See, I had choices to make. I could have given up or I could have pressed in and got better. In reality, I was living a Martha existence of serving but neglecting myself in my walk with God at the same time. In other words, I didn't have any balance. Now, the foundation of my faith has been my merry time spent with God in His presence as I walk. With every step I take, I receive healing. With every step I take, God is strengthening me. That He is changing and transforming me. Now, I don't know what process God has for you when you go through different things, whether it be sickness, whether you're believing for a child, whether you are believing for something in your life. But as you spend time with God, you're going to see that He is not only going to speak with you, but He is going to give you clear guidance. And so every day is not the same. Some days I'll go out and I'll worship. Some days it'll be the Word of God. Some days it'll be prayer. Now I said I didn't pray for two months because I was mad. It was only in that time because there was that connection that we slowly came back together again. And I'm here today to tell you I love God more than ever before. That He is my rock. He is my source. He is my strength. He is my everything. The key for both of us was He never left my side and I never disconnected from my relationship with Him. See, with every step, He's healing and strengthening us. I'm determined to keep moving forward with Him. And what the enemy meant to try to drive us apart made us closer. In Micah 7, 7 and 8, it says, But as for me, this is my choice, I will look to the Lord and be confident in Him. I will keep watch. I will wait with hope and expectancy. Say hope and expectancy. For the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O oh my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light to me. No matter how dark things get, light scatters darkness. The darkness cannot stand against the light. So it's not just enough to know and to quote scriptures. We're, there are going to be times that we have to do some true spiritual warfare. See, when we speak the word, we have to speak it and walk it out with the power and the authority that God has given his believers. All of us can expect to have to walk through some dark seasons at one time or another. But when we go through the dark, hard seasons of life, it's in the middle of the storm that God literally strengthens our heart. See, he strengthens our endurance, our will, our gumption, if you will, to keep moving forward. No matter how bad it gets, we need to have a confident expectation that we're going to eventually make it out of the storms. And we understand storms don't last always. Paul said it best in 2 Corinthians, and I know that there's people in here that feel this way, especially when they go through the storms of life. This is Paul talking about severe trials that him and his people went through. 
All of the hardships we passed through crushed us beyond our ability to endure. And we were so completely overwhelmed that we were about to give up entirely. Anybody ever been there? It felt like we had a death sentence written upon our hearts and we still feel it to this day. It was taught us to, lo- it was taught us to lose all faith in ourselves and the place of our trust in God who raises the dead. So when we go through those seasons, that our trust is not going to be in us, it's not going to be in our wisdom, our insight, our understanding, but as we trust in the Lord, we understand He's going to guide and direct us. See, He has rescued us from terrifying encounters with death. And now, say now, now, we fasten our hopes on Him to continue to deliver us from debt yet again. Yet again. And here's where CL came in. As you labor together with us through prayer, because there are so many interceding for us, our deliverance will cause even more people to give thanks to God. What a gracious gift of mercy surrounds us because of your prayers. That is something that I thank God for covenant love for, from my heart. It's because the sincere prayers, it's because the people that were crying out and the people we're upholding and lifting our families up. And I thank God for that. See, we have to understand that when we go through different things, that we're in the middle uh, of our seasons and the tribulations and the different things that we go through. Jesus told Peter in Luke 22, 31 and 34, that Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. Something weird happens in the middle of tribulation That even though you might be going through, it's when you help other people, that's when God will give you your healing. With the same measure that we're comforted, we're able to comfort others. And in the middle of the storm, understand that you're not in the storm by yourself. We need to get the idea of not, God, what am I going to do? But God, what are we going to do? Because you're not in this by yourself. In Isaiah 43, 2 through 3, it says, do not fear. Say that with me. Do not fear. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Another version of that in Hebrews 13 and 5 and 6. I will never, under any circumstance, I want you to take this to heart, the next time you go through something, because the enemy is going to tell you you're on your own. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I will never, under any circumstance, desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently say, this is our choice to trust God no matter what we face. The Lord is my helper in time of need. I will not be afraid. That's when we're in the middle of the storm that we can go through the storm with confidence. So we have to understand that Jesus is always with us in the middle of the storm. Now we can get distracted and we can listen to the voice of the enemy or we can focus on what God is saying. And I'm not going to go into it, but we see Peter walking on the water. And this is something that I want you to take a look at. Matthew 14, 22 and 33. Peter stepped out. He did something that wasn't natural. He stepped out and he actually walked on the water. It's when he started looking at the wind and the waves and that he had fear and he began to sink. But Jesus was there to pull him out of the water. When we look at the three Hebrew boys in the fire, Daniel 3, 16 through 30, we see that they were bound. They refused to worship the golden idol. That they were bound and thrown into the furnace. But there's something about when, the, when, when Jesus sets you free, then you're able to not be bound. That in the middle of the storm, that you can move with Him. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace, he said, didn't we just put three bound into the furnace? But I see four. And so Jesus will walk with you through the middle of the storm. You see, Jesus was with them in both their situations, but they stepped out trusting Jesus and kept moving forward. See, it was only when Jesus took 
when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and began to sink. We have to understand that we can't take our eyes off of Jesus. When you look at Psalm 18, we see God's love and concern for us in our situation. We see David as he went through his journey in Psalm 18. And I just want you to look at verses 16 through 24 for time's sake. We're not going to be able to read it. But when we hear of his bowels of mercy for us, it's not only that he is mad at what the enemy is trying to do to one of his children, but his love that he has for us. That we have to understand that you don't mess with God's kids and that you are covered, that he will absolutely come down and help you in the middle of your situation. Amen? And so when we talk about becoming the best versions of ourselves, the only way that is going to happen is if God is fully involved. We can't make it happen in and of ourselves. And as we go along the way, at times the enemy tries to distract us. He's going to try and do everything he can to disrupt the plans that God has for us. He'll try to use your insecurities. He's going to try to use your past, your failures, your fears, or anything that he can. And when I'm walking through the neighborhood, I swear some of them dogs probably have sound systems there. <laughs> it sounds loud. I mean loud out there. And the thing is, is that if you pay attention to them, you can have fear. Well, I know that there are fences and everything else. And Tracy Spicer at one time, and she's up in heaven with Vicky right now, um, her dog was a little uh, miniature um, Doberman, Pinscher. And every time I would go by the house as I was walking, he would hit that glass like he hated me. I don't know what I did to that little dog. I think he was just insecure or whatever. I would hit the glass. He would hit the glass like he's going to come through it. We have to understand that we have authority. That even if those barriers are breached, that little Doberman had one chance at the champ. And he came out. And there was nothing standing between us. So what you going to do? He was barking. Ah! I said, Horaba kera isi koraman. This man's crazy. I'm going the other way. We have to understand that we have authority. We are not some little prey animals. We are not having to be timid or fearful that even if something breaks loose, and this is for the walkers and the runners out there, use your authority. Even the dog understood the authority that God has given us. You see, we have his name, and that name Jesus gives us the ability to move mountains. When we speak with his authority, the forces of darkness are going to have to back up. They have no choice. There is no debate. They're going to have to back up. See, the enemy is constantly speaking to us. When was the last time that we spoke to him? See, we have authority. But many don't know who they really are and don't understand that they have real power and authority to stand against the wiles of the enemy. But if we begin to speak back to those things that speak to us, things begin to happen. If we're believing for children, if we're believing for marriages, we need to speak to the enemy. We need to speak to those mountains and say, be thou removed. We need to speak to those strongholds, our finances. We need to speak to those things. And so becoming the best version of yourself isn't in you. It's only found in God. It's not about people. It's not about your past. It's not about the culture. Whether we see it or not, God is trying to transform our identity and to bring us into alignment with his idea of what we should look like and how we should carry ourselves in this world. We should look different. When we were singing holy, 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 that means different. That's how we look. That we are different. And we need to allow our light to shine. We don't need to hide our light. See, when I was born, I was Joseph and Marguerite Adderley's son. Their DNA gave me the potential to be everything of who I am. But when we get saved or return to the Lord, you become a child of God with his spiritual DNA. 
which means you have the full potential to be everything that God says that you can be. But we need to have the ability to see ourselves as God sees us. It's when we spend time in His Word and we spend in time in His presence, He begins to shape and mold us. He begins to show us who we truly are in Him. See, many times God allows hard trials and tribulation to help shape and mold us. But God doesn't waste anything. When we go through the good times or we go through the bad times, He doesn't waste anything. You see, a lot of times we hate trouble and we want it over quickly. And I want to use a natural example. If you try to microwave a brisket, the only thing that you're going to get is a piece of rubber. A lot of times we want it over now. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of And Satan might not have anything to do with it. God is trying to tenderize us. When you talk about a brisket, it's a process that it takes time, that it can't be on high heat all the time. But then as it's smoked, it begins to become tenderized. And that's what God wants to do with us a lot of times that he wants us to be tenderized. And brisket needs to smoke slowly over time. It becomes tender and falls apart. Brisket doesn't take an hour to cook. It takes hours. But when it comes out, it's amazing. It takes time and patience. The thing is, is that we have to understand that things that God wants to do is going to take time and we got to have patience. This isn't have it your way. This isn't Burger King. It isn't like you're going through the drive through where we don't get our, our, our shake or whatever. In two minutes, we go crazy, don't we? No. We have to have patience, and we need to have consistency. I think that's one of the big things that we don't have. It's in the middle of the storm. There are times we need to be still, and we need to trust and allow God to work on our behalf. And I know that's hard because we always want to keep moving forward on our own. But the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Know that God has your best interest, that he knows the plans and the purposes for you. In Isaiah 40 and 31, it says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall, say shall, yeah. renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, very quickly, generally, there's three reasons why a person gets surgery. So when we are on that table and God is doing something, the three reasons that you get surgery, either to take something out, to put something in, or to fix something. Surgery can be a very painful process, both during and after surgery. That's why they give you anesthesia, local pain medication, pain pills to help manage the pain as you go through the season of healing. And here's something that I've never seen. I've never seen the patient moving on the operating table when the surgeon is working. We have to be still. See, sometimes we need to get out of the way and be still and try not to do surgery on ourselves because we can make the situation a whole lot worse. When I go in for surgery, my hope and my expectation aren't in that surgeon. Uh-uh. When you pray and you go in for a surgery, your hope and your expectation need to be in God. Because it's God who works through the team and gives them the skill, ability, competency, and wisdom to know what to do. It's not based on who they are. It's based upon who God is. God's got it. Say that with me. God's got it. So we don't have to worry and we don't have to be afraid because we understand that God loves us. He wants the best for us. I believe that God's calling all of us to break out of the mold of how others perceive us, the false expectations, the lies, the false words spoken over us, and any of our own false expectations not given to us by God. God is doing a new thing, that he wants us to think in different ways. I look at an illustration here. And you see the old, outdated computer, and you see the new computer. Is that the old one? <laughs> I can't see it. Okay. What's happening right now is you have a lot of people that are in 2024, and they're trying to act like that. They're trying to act like what they did back in the 80s, and they're trying to use the same type of program for the 80s. But God is doing a new thing. What worked back then is not going to work now. 
that as you begin to grow, things change. Things become more powerful and more effective. This is what God says who we are, and we need to operate like that. We have to change our programming, and we have to come into alignment with God. He gives us better programming, increased potential, and it works a whole lot faster. See, the reason that we sometimes feel like the old computer is that we're trying to live in this MacBook world with an Apple II type thinking. So the last thing I want to say is God is challenging us to move forward into our new season. There are people here that God has said, I need you to move into this next season. I need you to step up. I want to tell you that from the youngest to the oldest, left to right, front to back, everybody that is on live stream, that God needs you. That God has placed you in the ministry such as it fits, suits Him. That He has a role. That there is greatness in you. A lot of times we get fearful. But what God is saying, you have to add your yes to it. Now, when I came back to God, he gave me a download of what this next season is going to look like. And he said, you can either go your own way or you can go and follow me. And all I kept saying was, yes, 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 yes. Whatever you want to do. And so we don't want to remain stuck. That if God is speaking to you, that he said, I need you to pray. I love what Pastor Robert said, that there's going to be opportunities to pray. Maybe God has said that you need to be in the media department. Maybe it's in the children's department. Destiny generation. What God is saying, stop looking at yourself. Stop trying to figure things out. He will work out the details. But if God is telling you, I need you to do this and this, then the best thing that we can do is follow him. Yes, we're becoming a church that looks like heaven, which means none of us have arrived. But then as each person begins to take that responsibility in their own personal growth and expansion, then God is able to strengthen the whole body. This is not a time to sit back. We saw what happened yesterday. We know what's coming up in November. The last time that we went through something like this in COVID, I'm just going to say it, the body of Christ fell on their face. That we looked just like the culture. We acted like the culture. We were attacking each other. And as Pastor Robert said, it is not Republican, Democrat, or Independent. It is the blood of Jesus that binds us together. That we are a family of believers. In the grand scheme of things, it's the kingdom of God above everything else. And so we need to keep our eyes and our focus upon him. Church, it's time to move forward. It's time to be able to get back into the race. It's time to come off the sidelines. Many have been spectators for a long time, but God wants us to be participating in whatever he has for us to do. Maybe it's greeting. Maybe it's ushering. It could be any. <laughs> we got one over here. <laughs> there are so many opportunities that God is trying to draw us in. And here's the good thing about it. When you take that first step, you're not opening up that door. You're not kicking the doors down. No, God is opening up doors that no man can close and closing doors that no man can open. God is challenging us to come out of our comfort zone. It's only when you come out of the comfort zone are you going to be able to see what God has for you individually and corporately. I'm sitting here looking at the time, so I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. Y'all, <laughs> hey, that's a minor miracle right there. <laughs> I'm not going to press through it. But I'm just praying that if God has said anything to you today, the first thing that we need to realize that it's God, that he needs to be first place. If there's anything else before God, then we have it out of order. The way that God is able to do the things that he wants to do is when we add our yes to whatever it is. But we have to have our ears open to be able to hear his voice. He is speaking. He's speaking. Whether he's speaking through a message, whether he is speaking through a person, whether 
you hear something on TV, God is speaking to us all the time. I walk with him and I hear the cry of his heart. It's time for us to be to not be indifferent. To step into what he has for us to do. And the first thing is is to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you've never received him as Lord and Savior, this is an opportunity to be able to step into what he has for us. That's the first thing. But then he also said that there's people that have been here that have been going through the motions. I know at one point I was half-stepping. Can I be honest? I was comfortable. And I was complacent. And I did not pursue God. The Bible says that they that pursue God believe first that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. God is looking for people that have a hunger, that want to truly get to know Him. He's looking for people that are hungry for His presence. Yeah, when I walk, I'm out there by myself. But I'm literally holding hands with them. They'll say, God, whatever you want to do, I just want to go with you. I just want to feel your presence. I want to know you in a deeper and a more understandable way. I don't want to be seen. Ever. It's not about us. None of this is about us. That God gives us gifts. He gives us the ability to be able to serve others. It's not about us. It's about Him. And when we all take our rightful places, we become the expression of Jesus Christ. Through our personalities, don't ever reject whatever personality that God has given you. He created you that way because you are a part of the whole. You are not insignificant. You are not insignificant. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, you are a part of the tapestry that God is weaving together. He is looking for people that are going to say, yes, I want everything that you want. I want to do everything that I was created to do. And I don't care if anyone gets me or doesn't get me. I am yours and you are mine. And nothing can ever separate that. God is looking for people that are hungry. If we don't get into position now, especially when we see what's happening in this country, when we see everything that's taking place right now, we can't speak because we have the ability to change the culture we have an ability to be light in darkness. We have the ability to speak truth against error. God has called us for this time and for these purposes that He and He alone would be glorified. Unapologetically, we need to lift up Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And God is calling His church begin to pray. Begin to get into the presence. Let Him soften your heart. Let the Word shape and mold us. Listen for His voice. He is speaking. He loves you. Maybe that's just the first thing that we need to understand for real. Get a revelation of His love. It's not about anything that we've done. It's not because we're so special. It has everything to do with Jesus' sacrifice and His love for us and the Father when He died on the cross. He understood that we're going to have challenges and things that we go through. And so God is drawing people. He's drawing people by His love. He's not trying to beat people over the head or anything else. But He is drawing us with cords of a man and with bands of love. One of the things that if God is speaking to you that He wants to you to engage. CLC, CL serving to 97,000 takes about a minute. Takes about a minute. Just right there. CL serve to 97,000. 
and someone will give you a call. And that could be the first day of the rest of your life. Those people that are healed, those people that are strong, those people that know that they're called by God and that they can step out. Now, I know Pastor Cam can't always say this, but I can. That God is looking for those that want to be used. Is there anybody that wants to be used in here? Is there anybody that want to make a difference in here? Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together if you want to make a difference. Now, due to time's sake, the only thing that I'm going to do is if you have never made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, if you know that you haven't fully engaged with God, or you don't know for sure that if you died today that you would be going to heaven, we're just going to say a simple prayer, and I want us to say it all together. If there's anything in this message that's touched you today, I want you to say it with me and let's say it together. Father God, I declare that Jesus Christ is your Son. That He came to the earth in the flesh and He died for my sins. And He is alive. I declare Jesus is Lord. That You are my Heavenly Father. I thank You for the plan and the partnership of the Holy Spirit. I am a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I thank you my sin has been forgiven. Shape me. Mold me. Change and transform me. That I am your child. And you are my God. Use me. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now put your hands together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I ask that you go ahead and stand to your feet. Can we have our altar ministers come down? For those that decided that they wanted to take that next step, I'm just going to say a prayer of commissioning. And we're just going to believe that God is going to speak to your hearts. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for each and every person. Father, you saw every hand that was raised. You say every heart that's engaged. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that this was not a message of condemnation. But Father, you are challenging your people to come up higher. You are challenging your people to be everything that you have called and destined for them to be. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, that your people will steward their seasons well. That whatever it is that you have called for them to do, we add our yes and our expectation in you. So we thank you that they move with confidence, that they move with boldness. They will not be timid. They will not be fearful, but they will simply trust in you because they understand that your hand is upon them. Now, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you will go with us throughout this week. We pray, Father God, that there would be new discoveries, that there would be breakthrough like never before. That, Father, in our quiet time and even when we are with others, that there would be an outpouring of your spirit, an outpouring of your love, an outpouring of your power. We thank you, Lord God, that you love us. We thank you, Lord God, that you are opening doors for us. And we thank you, Lord God, that we will embrace this season. We will embrace those things that pertain to life and godliness. And we declare that the wicked one touches them not. So we ask you to go and encamp and entrench angels about your people we thank you for the opportunities to be able to share who you are we thank you for the opportunities to serve that we are yours and you are ours we bless you and we give you praise we ask it all in Jesus name and all God's people said amen God bless you and have a wonderful week we'll see you on Wednesday night